And uh, before we get started, let's have another, uh, say another prayer. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful that we are your children and are promised a life in a land where there will be no disasters and where all will be at peace. Uh, help us to be wise so that we can avoid uh, disasters. And um, if we happen to be in them, we ask for your protection. And be with us as we study in this next hour. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things I've thought about uh, doing uh, is uh, creating little signs for in the yard or in the window. Uh, you see these that say protected by ADT, and uh, you, you can, uh, it, there's any number of them that uh, you, once you have a system in your house that will identify intruders, well, you can put a sign out to warn them. And I, I want to make little signs that say protected by God and protected by the angels and put a text there uh, so that if somebody has a flashlight uh, or a Bible on their phone, they can look up the text and see what it says, that the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him and delivers them. And hopefully that would scare them away. I don't have an alarm system in my home, but I do ask God to protect me every day. And we do lock the windows and the doors. Uh, so we do take reasonable precautions. I want to talk this hour about disasters. And there are a lot of different terror tactics. Back in the 1970s, there was hijacking of aircrafts. And uh, that has pretty much uh, been eliminated by taking safety precautions. And then there used to be taking of hostages. You don't see that as much anymore. Uh, suicide bombers, there are still suicide bombers, aren't there? There are uh, uh, chemical toxins uh, that can be released. There are biological infectious germs. And of course, I think the conspiracy theorists think that this COVID-19 uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, is a biological weapon that escaped from the laboratory. And uh, it's certainly possible for uh, biological weapons to escape from uh, laboratories, uh, but I, I don't think this is one of those. Uh, we do know that these uh, that germs are mutating from time to time, and I wouldn't push the put it past the devil to uh, mess with the genetics of organisms, and uh, then to see that they they spread. Um, but I, very often it can be very natural. Uh, then there are radiological agents, radioactive materials. Uh, nuclear bombs. We haven't seen one since Nagasaki 75 years ago, earlier this week. And uh, the favorite device of uh, terrorists now is explosive devices. They blow this up, blow that up. And that's how it is. And this, this study of terrorist weapons uh, can uh, be called CBRNE. A chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. And so we're going to uh, look in a little more detail at uh, these weapons, and then we're going to look at systems that can be used to detect them. And I, I think you'll be surprised. First, we take a look at chemical agents. And um, chemical poisoning, uh, There, if you see somebody that's sick, that would be a suspected case. And if there is a credible threat associated with that, with the person with the symptoms, that would be a probable case. And if you then have laboratory proof, well, then that's a confirmed case. And so these are exact words that public health people use. And so when you hear them say, well, we have 60 suspected cases, that will tell you they have 60 people with signs and symptoms. If we say, if they say we have 60 probable cases, then they know that there is a threat that has been associated with it that is uh, credible. And if they say we have confirmed cases, then they have laboratory proof uh, for it. There are a lot of chemical agents that are very toxic. 
And uh, I'm not going to mention most of these. Uh, some of them are obvious and you know it, like carbon monoxide, cyanide, um, and all of these things are mercury, heavy metal. And uh, then there are uh, others that you recognize on this, this list. Uh, toxic alcohols, uh, currently hand rub, hand uh, lotions that are bactericidal are very popular, but there are over a hundred of them that have been identified that have uh, methyl alcohol in them and are toxic to humans. And so toxic alcohols can be bad for you. And uh, one of the ones that uh, is really, really toxic are nerve agents. And so I want to talk just a little bit about nerve agents. And there are four of them. Uh, three of them were, uh, deter were invented by German chemists uh, during World War II, uh, sarin, soman, and taboon. And there have been sarin gas poisonings. The last one I think was in Japan. Uh, a sarin gas was released on a subway and a number of people died. Uh, then the V agents were uh, developed by the British and VX is clearly the most toxic nerve agent that we have. And they have some unique characteristics. They are related to organic phosphate pesticides. And I've, I've had people try to kill themselves with organic phosphate pesticides. I admitted a man to the ICU who drank a bottle of diazinon back when that was still on the market. And we had to struggle to uh, keep him alive for a while. And once he was alive uh, and well, then the police took him to jail because his wife was in the ICU in Arlington where he had stabbed her. So he stabbed his wife and then almost killed her and then tried to kill himself by drinking diazinon. And uh, he had organic phosphate poisoning. Uh, these nerve agents have no odor, no color, no taste. They interfere with nerve endings that use acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter and make it so it's unable to break down acetylcholine. And uh, this then will rather immediately, I mean within seconds, will give you a runny nose, pinpoint pupils, sweating, diarrhea, confusion, paralysis, confusion, convulsions, uh, con and respiratory failure is part of convulsions, and then you die. And uh, you, you can die in five minutes, you can die in 10 or 15 minutes, uh, but you will die. And these chemical agents can be absorbed through the lungs. You can breathe them in. If you swallowed them, they could be uh, absorbed. And the VX in particular, that last British agent, uh, the smallest drop, the size of a pinhead on your hand can soak in and kill you in just a few minutes. Uh, there is an antidote. You, you can stop them. If you can give a person atropine, uh, that blocks acetylcholine nerve endings and, and it'll block that poison right off of them and, and they'll get better. You can also regenerate the acetylcholinesterase that's been poisoned with a drug called uh, pralidoxime chloride. People just call it 2PAM, 2PAM chloride, or just 2PAM. And uh, that works to reverse it really well. And, and if a person is advanced to the point where they had have seizures, you give them an injection of Valium and it stops the seizures, gives you a little time till the rest of these things uh, wear off. Now, I can tell you, that in every major city, uh, there are stockpiles of these agents. And I can tell you that for every major sporting event, uh, Super Bowls, things like that, these things are located right there in case there should be the release of a poison gas. Uh, you've got enough agent to help 10,000 people and uh, have it right at hand. Of course, you don't see it, they don't advertise it, but I can tell you that any large gathering in the United States is protected from nerve gas release uh, with stockpiles of these agents that are mobile and can be moved around and can be used in a moment's notice to save lives of uh, people if there is a release. Then there are biological agents, and the biological agents are germs that kill people. And uh, anthrax is uh, 
probably one of the main ones. Smallpox is interesting because there's been no smallpox anywhere in the world among any people since about 1978, maybe 76. Uh, the last case in the United States was 1949 down on the uh, Mexico-Texas border. And uh, smallpox, people that get smallpox, about 30% die. So it has a high mortality rate. Uh, you have monkeypox, a little bit like smallpox, not as deadly. The plague is more deadly. Probably 50, 60, 70% of people who get the plague will die. And uh, uh, so it's a dangerous agent. But it's hard to spread. Uh, it, it doesn't weaponize well. The best way to spread the plague, uh, well, tularemia, brucellosis. Tularemia you can get from rabbits. Brucellosis you can get from cattle. Q fever. And then you have the hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, Ebola uh, is uh, one of the hemorrhagic fevers. And there are two or three others as well. I don't know if I say anything about anthrax, but maybe I will while I'm here. Anthrax is especially easy to weaponize because uh, you don't spread the germ, you spread the spores. And the spores can be uh, weaponized. Uh, many years ago, uh, a senator, uh, Tom Daschle from South Dakota, was sent a letter that had some anthrax spores in it. And there was enough anthrax in that envelope to kill a million people. And uh, fortunately, there are medicines uh, that will keep you from getting sick if you've been exposed. Here are the actual organisms for some of these things. Uh, typhoid fever, Salmonella typhosa. And uh, ricin comes from ricin toxin. And uh, you can put that on the end of a knife or a pin and stab somebody and they'll die from it. And nobody will know what it is uh, for about a week. And so about a week after they're dead, they'll figure it out. Uh, Staphylococca enterotoxin B, you can actually get that from a church picnic if they let uh, potato salad sit out or, or it sat out for a day or several hours and got to room temperature. Staphylococcus um, will grow in the potato salad and the mayonnaise and make an enterotoxin. You eat it, you're sick in just an hour or two with really bad, bad diarrhea. You can become dehydrated, you can die. Uh, cholera, uh, of course, gives you diarrhea and everybody dies of dehydration. If you can rehydrate people fast enough, they won't die of cholera. And the, the plague is caused by Yersinia pestis. And how do you weaponize biological agents? Well, you, uh, the, the spores have to be very small, one to five microns, and any electrostatic charge has to be removed because if it has a positive or a negative charge, it'll stick to surfaces. And you don't want it to stick to surfaces. You want it to float in the air. And actually, uh, during the Cold War, the United States probably produced a... Uh, a grand total of maybe 400 tons of weaponized anthrax that we could use uh, against the enemy. And after the Cold War, and we got to talking to the Soviets about it, it turned out they were making about a thousand tons every year. It took us decades to get 400 tons, and they were producing a thousand tons a year. And I, th it was, I think they were produced on Sakhalin Island uh, and uh, the water level has dropped in that sea. And as a result, it's no longer an island, it's an isthmus. And, uh, and it's part of the uh, former Soviet Union. And where they buried these uh, uh, stainless steel containers containing tons of uh, uh, weaponized uh, spores are not known. Uh, nobody knows where they're hidden anymore. The records have been lost. And uh, so the uh, there are terrorists that are looking for these. You can go to that island, you can culture uh, the uh, toxin right from the soil, but uh, culturing it is one thing, but making a weapon out of the spores is another. And they would really love to find, if terrorists found the spores, they could uh, drive down a freeway uh, with a thing and spray it out the window of a car or a truck, and the wind could blow it all over the city. And, uh, and you could have millions of people exposed. Uh, there was an accidental release of about 100 grams 
uh, in a Soviet uh, uh, laboratory. And it went up the vent hood and animals and people for 75 miles downstream died uh, from it. So uh, anthrax is uh, a very bad actor. Uh, millions could be exposed at one time. But prophylaxis is good. If you know what happened, it takes anywhere from five to 20 days or 30 days uh, for a spore to infect you. So if you could get on prophylactic antibiotics, if you could take uh, ciprofloxacin 500 milligrams a day for 45 days or 50 days, you would never get sick with anthrax because when the spore uh, started to become active in the body, uh, you could kill it just like that. And so the truth is, you see the last words, the, the last thing on the slide there is SNS, stands for the Strategic National Stockpile. And I can tell you that around the United States, at strategic spots, they have uh, enough uh, ciprofloxacin, enough doxycycline, enough amoxicillin, that they could provide enough doses for any city in the United States and get it there within 12 hours. And so uh, it would be possible to deliver all of the antibiotics that you need uh, to a given city. Uh, and we're talking about, and enough to last for 45 or 60 days. And so the strategic national stockpile uh, is a valuable source uh, to keep, uh, to protect our country in case there is an, an outbreak of a, bio, a bacterial biological agent. And, uh, we're, we're grateful for that. And so how do you spread these spores? Well, you could mail them to people in an envelope. You could create an aerosol at a sporting event, a squirt bottle. Pretend you're squirting yourself and squirt some up in the air when they hit a home run and let it float around through the stadium. Uh, another way to do it is to hire a crop duster airplane and just fly over a city and release several hundred tons or several hundred pounds of spores over a city. Or a better way to do it with a plague is to get in a, a sick person and make him walk in public places, have him walk through airports or train stations and expose people because the plague doesn't spread by spores. Uh, but if you cough on somebody, uh, they can uh, spread it to others. And so if you uh, have a sick person walking around in public, you could potentially expose a few hundred people who would then get on airplanes and trains and travel to distant places and start outbreaks all over the country. And uh, you could also contaminate food and drinks. Uh, botulism to uh, toxin could be put in the water supply uh, and uh, distributed through a city. And you could kill tens of thousands of people with uh, botulism toxin distributed through the water system. And so what is the defense against that? Well, the defense is early detection. Uh, not necessarily, yes, you want to early detect sick people, but you want to early detect uh, bad things in the environment. And so uh, there is environmental monitoring in metropolitan areas. I can tell you that in metropolitan areas, there is a system called BioWatch. And uh, we had uh, these filters that air was being sucked through them all the time. And these were located on top of buildings and strategic places all across the metropolitan areas in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And once a day, somebody in a white suit would go up, take a filter out, put another filter in. The filters were bagged. They were all taken to the biodefense laboratory. And then they were all analyzed to see if there was any, any abnormal spores or germs on those filters. And they screened the filters for 22 different biological agents that might have been released in the air. And so major metropolitan areas are being screened daily uh, for the presence of pathogens. And uh, the newer iteration of these machines uh, actually uh, don't filter the air. They actually put a laboratory up on the, on the roof and the, uh, they connect it to the internet 
and uh, the laboratory samples the air every four hours. So instead of being tested once a day, you're being uh, uh, te tested six times a day, and uh, all of the reagents are there. And if there if uh, if there's a hit, uh, then they print out the profile, so to speak, or they send it electronically to the biodefense laboratory. And if they confirm it. Uh, then uh, they can go collect an actual sample. But uh, I can tell you that every male sorting facility has a machine to detect anthrax above the male sorting machines because these letters go through there, packages go through there, and they're being squished. Uh, and as they're being squished, they puff out uh, any air that's in the envelope. And so if there's any being sent in the mail, uh, they'll be detected and uh, the detection uh, laboratory checks the mail like every hour. And so if something went through, the alarm would go off within an hour. All the trucks that were taking the mail would be called back and, uh, and you would be able to contain it. And the letter would never be delivered uh, because it would be detected before delivery ever, to, ever took place. And so these kind of surveillance systems, and these surveillance systems, I can assure you, are in airports and in uh, major train stations, and uh, probably by now in uh, in large uh, malls or a uh, place where there's a lot of people, and the air is being sampled. And these machines will analyze for 22 different pathogens at a, at a time. And then there is uh, another system that's very interesting called the ROD system. And it's a real-time outbreak and disease surveillance system. And uh, maybe I've got something on that here now. Well, we may come to it later, but let me explain it just a little bit. Uh, this is a system in pharmacies. And they keep track of all of the Tylenol that's being bought and the ibuprofen that's being bought and all the cough syrup that's being bought. And uh, so this is retail drug sales and in real time. And uh, so if, if there's a meta metropolitan area where suddenly it is seen that there is uh, people are buying ibuprofen and Tylenol, uh, they, will, they will think that there's probably an outbreak of fever in that area. And if there's a sale of a lot of cough syrup, then they can, they'll say there's a lot, there's a blip in that area. And uh, this is being monitored. So the sale of uh, medications, over-the-counter medications, sale of over-the-counter medications is being monitored in all of the major metropolitan areas and uh, tens of thousands of pharmacies. And the data is automatically collected. It's big data. And the computer uh, continuously analyzes and looks for outbreaks. Uh, but uh, the sale of medication is one. Then you have the EMS system. And uh, I used to log into that in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, it, uh, it tracks in real time all the calls that they are having. And it also maps them. And so, and this is also analyzed by computers so that if you have, if you have a metropolitan area where there's an unusual number of ambulances being dispatched, then you'd want to take a look at uh, where those ambulances go and what kind of a problems are being diagnosed. And then there's also a, a mapping system for 911 calls. And, uh, uh, and so if there are a lot of 911 calls and they show up in an area, you know something's going on there. And so those are being uh, mapped as well. And uh, in Tarrant County, we had a system that, we, uh, that was tapped into all of the emergency rooms of all of the hospitals in uh, Tarrant County. And uh, as soon as the diagnosis was entered by the, or the suspected diagnosis by the uh, unit secretary at the check-in window. We knew the age of the individual. We knew the gender of the individual. We knew the zip code where the person was. We knew what their symptoms were. We did not know their name. We did not know their exact address, but we knew what their symptoms were. And, uh, th and uh, these are all coded. So every suspected diagnosis has a code. And so these codes were being mapped. Uh, and if if there was an outbreak in a community and 10 people got sick with something and they went to 10 different hospitals, this system would pick it up. 
because although no one hospital would call public health, we would know that there are uh, people in 10 different hospitals with the same diagnosis and they all came from the same zip code. Maybe they're all of the same age group. Maybe they're all of the same gender. Uh, and we would be able to uh, identify and the computer would automatically al uh, send an alarm to us and we could go and look at the details. And uh, so this is a syndromic surveillance syndrome. And uh, it has been refined now to the point where all of the laboratory confirmed diagnosis are being sent automatically to central data processing things as well. So that if a laboratory identifies a pathogen that's likely to be a weaponized pathogen, the truth is that would uh, raise a red flag and if six hospitals identified the same pathogen, this would uh, ring an alarm bell. So not only do we track diagnoses, but we can track cultures uh, and, and organisms that are being developed. And these uh, systems are very often uh, citywide or region-wide. And so it's all called syndromic surveillance. And... Uh, here are radiological agents, and uh, these are radioactive isotopes. And uh, cesium-137 is used a lot in industry. Uh, Cobalt-60 is used a lot. Uh, then there are these other things. When you get down to the bottom there, plutonium and uranium, those are used mainly in, in uh, bombs and the like. But uh, what, what could happen is if an industry that uses a cobalt-60 source to x-ray the integrity of the welds that they have, and uh, their radioactive source is very carefully guarded and uh, monitored, but if somebody was to steal the cobalt-60, they could attach it to an explosive, uh, a car bomb, and blow up the car bomb in the middle of the city, and it wouldn't kill very many people, uh, but the contamination could never be cleaned up because you've got radioactive material all over all of the buildings, and it takes five years for the half-life to go away. And uh, so dirty bombs, you attach a radioactive isotope to a conventional explosive, and this results in mass hysteria, but not mass destruction. Not many would be killed, and there's not much physical damage that would be done, but the radiation contamination would make cleanup really difficult, and it would take many, many years to get a, get a city up and running again. And I can tell you that there are terrorists that would just love to get their hands on radioactive material so that they could create a dirty bomb. And uh, every radioactive material used by industry or laboratories is guarded and monitored uh, continuously uh, by the uh, Department of Energy. And what if you're exposed uh, to some of these things? Uh, we, we haven't touched nuclear yet. Uh, of course, nuclear, there's not a lot of defense to the nuclear. Poof, you're gone. It's vaporized. And uh, uh, there's not much there. And then explosive devices. We, we know a lot about explosive devices. So I'm not going to touch on that very much. But the basics of de decontamination, what if you have anthrax spores or germs or chemicals? Uh, how do you uh, decontaminate yourself? Well, 90% of the contamination is on your skin and clothes. So if you take your clothes off and take a shower, you've gotten rid of the contamination. That's true whether it's biological, whether it's chemical, whether it's radiological. So you bag up the clothes for disposal. And to prevent radiation damage, there are three things to remember. One is distance. The further you are away from it, the less radiation you're going to get. Shielding, if you can hide behind concrete or metal, it's not going to get you, and the time of exposure. So if you can get out of there as fast as you can, the better off you'll be. So here's nuclear, uh, the mushroom cloud of death, and most nuclear devices are on rockets or in, and in silos or in submarines or in bombs that can be delivered. And I can tell you that we have airplanes in the air loaded with hydrogen bombs continuously. They do not have to take off from land and uh, they are refueled in the air and they fly continuously. And then they're switched out with other uh, bombers 
And so uh, the weapons are always in the air. And of course, rockets can be sent up very quickly as well. The thing that we're really worried about is small suitcase devices. And you can create nuclear weapons that would fit in an attache case. And that would really kill hundreds of thousands of people if it w went off in the heart of a city. And uh, so there are, I, I can tell you that every container that enters United States waters is screened for, radio for radiation. And I can tell you that every truck that crosses the Mexico or Canadian border is screened for radiological agents. And uh, explosives, the most popular weapon of terrorists. And uh, explosives can do some bad damage. And of course we had that big explosion in Beirut uh, more than 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate <laughs> blew up the city, uh, blew down a bunch of their hospitals. So uh, a lot of people uh, and a lot of pharmacies. So there's a lot of people uh, that can't get their medicines, transplant people that can't get their immune suppressive drugs. It's very, very sad. And of course, the question there, that stuff had been stored there for years, like five years. And uh, who allowed that? And uh, then how did it happen to go off? Uh, did somebody trigger it or was it an accident? I mean, we really don't know. Uh, it uh, killed mostly civilians. And Lebanon is not particularly a, uh, a hot target, you know. So I have a feeling it was probably an accident. And improvised explosive device. Planes have been used as bombs, September 11. Trucks carrying bombs. We remember Tim McVeigh and the Murrah building in uh, Tulsa. Uh, there are devices by the road, IEDs. You got rocket propelled devices, RPGs. You have suicide bombers that, uh, where they wrap explosions around themselves and then they wrap film with nails or ball bearings to try to increase their lethality. Pipe bombs, letter bombs, explosive devices. And so uh, it would be good, and, uh, and I'm gonna go through this next section really, really fast. Uh, but it, it would be good for you to be prepared. So how can a person be prepared for this kind of attack? And um, it's good to have a first aid kit uh, in case you should hurt yourself. And these are some of the first aid supplies you might want to have. I have a red and black uh, duffel bag that... Uh, I, I have these kinds of things that I can put in and I can take it and throw it in the car or take it with me and it'll have copies of everything that I need. So here are first aid supplies. And of course, if you're on medicine, you need to take your medicine with you, have a month's supply or more uh, ahead of time stored uh, so that you can use it and rotate the stock daily. And you know, who knows if you're drinking water from a stream, you might need anti-diarrheal medicine. Uh, if you run a fever, you might need some aspirin or something like that. You may need an extra pair of glasses. Hygiene supplies, you can need washcloths and towels, toothpaste, brushes, toothbrushes, shampoo and a comb, maybe some deodorants if you've got other people around you, uh, maybe some shaving cream, lip balm, insect repellent, a little mirror, some garbage bags for waste, and a shovel for digging a latrine and some toilet paper. Uh, then you've got, you need some extra batteries, a battery powered radio, NOAA weather radio, flashlight, signal flare, matches in a waterproof container, maybe some duct tape and scissors, uh, some plastic sheeting, uh, maybe a little tent, so a compass, some work gloves, and then you need some kitchen items so you can open cans and have a little cook, cooking unit, a uh, small cooking stove maybe with some fuel or some cans of Sterno. Then, hey, we can't live without a cell phone, can we? Or an iPod, or, and you have to have a solar or mechanical charging device. Then you want to have your books with you, your, a Bible, some other books, maybe some games, toys for children. Some water, some ready to eat foods would be good. Uh, some documents. You're gonna be, have to be able to prove who you are. 
Uh, you need some cash, need some coins, because credit cards aren't going to work at that point in time, at some point, but take them with you if you got them. Extra set of house and car keys, a copy of your birth certificate, your marriage license, your driver's license, your passport, social security cards, then you need your wills, your deeds, inventory of your household goods, your insurance papers, immunization records, bank and credit card account numbers, any stocks or bonds you might have, emergency contact list, who should they call if they find you at the side of the road, maps to get you here or there in case Google Maps doesn't work at that time, phone numbers, clothes and bedding, couple of changes of clothes, sturdy boots or shoes, rain gear, hat, gloves, extra socks, extra underwear, sunglasses, maybe a blanket, some pillows. Control measures, isolation and quarantine. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, these are control measures that a health authority might order. We have isolation orders now from people and control measures can be applied to individuals or property or geographic area. As health officer, I had the authority to impose these kinds of things on the public and uh, the, it's nice to have somebody who's authorized to do that who can't be sued. So the public health authority uh, can do strange things and, uh, and end up not being sued over them uh, because you've been granted that authority by the state. And um, if somebody violates the health authority's order, you substantiate that with a court and then the court will give you a court order to back you up. But in a state, a governor can, can declare a state of emergency. And notice this, a governor may suspend the provisions of any regulatory statute or orders or rules of any state agency. And so a governor can do, is not bound by law. A, a governor in case of emergency can do virtually an order anything that the governor wants to have happen. And you may want to remember that because we have a constitution, but here is where the federal government can go around the constitution. This is a direct quote from the uh, federal government. It says, whenever the director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention determines that the measures taken by health authorities of any state are insufficient to prevent the spread of any of the communicable diseases from a state to any other state, he or she may take such measures to prevent the such spread of the diseases as he or she deserves reasonably necessary. So if it looks like governors aren't doing a good job, the federal government can certainly step in. And we've seen the president try to do this a little bit to protect, to protect federal buildings. You send in federal troops. The state doesn't ask for them. They just show up in federal buildings, and they're doing it because there's a perceived danger to federal facilities. But if the government can take that kind of freedom at the drop of a pandemic, think of what they could do at other times as well. Is there liability? No. There is immunity from civil liability for actions taken without compensation in a disaster at the request of a government agency, if emergency care provided during an emergency, and there's immunity for actions by a state or local officer or volunteer who performs a homeland security activity at the request or under the direction of a government agency. And so they can recruit hundreds and thousands of people to work for them and do what they want them to do uh, in the name of an emergency, and they would have to do it. And there, uh, the administrative structure has all be already been dis decided, and it's called the NIMS, N-I-M-S, and it's the National Incident Management System. And uh, 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 localities practice it with the state, state practice it with the federal government and with the FBI. And uh, these uh, kinds of things are practiced on a regular basis. And I can tell you that I met uh, several times a month with different agencies uh, to, to practice these kinds of things. And so after saying all of that, 
Should we worry about what's going to happen tomorrow? And here is where health, this is where this may have health evangelism activity rather than just trying to scare you. Uh, we don't need to worry about tomorrow. Listen to this from Mrs. White. She says, live the life of faith day by day. Do not become anxious and distressed about the time of trouble and thus have a time of trouble beforehand. Do not keep thinking. I am afraid I shall not stand in the great testing day. You are to live for the present, for this day only. Tomorrow is not yours. Today you are to maintain the victory over self. Today you are to live a life of prayer. Today you are to fight the good fight of faith. Today you are to believe that God blesses you. And as you gain the victory over darkness and unbelief, you will meet the requirements of the master and will become a blessing to those around you. I think that's what we need to do. We need to practice that every day. The most unconcerned people, no matter what disaster is striking, the most unconcerned should be the health evangelist. Because the truth is, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. And... Uh, we need to be careful. We need to be aware of all these things that I've talked about. We need to take precautions, but we don't want to worry about it. This is a motto I had on my desk uh, in my corner office in the health department in Tarrant County and in the city of Fort Worth. And it was about that big. Uh, and of course, uh, not your big screen, but uh, uh, it was on an eight and a half by 11 and it was right on my desk. And it says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And the director of the health department, the administrative director would come in and uh, her name was Brewer, uh, Miss Brewer. She would look and she had pointed that and she said, I don't believe that. And I would just say, well, I do. And... Uh, I believe unless the Lord watches over this city and over this county, we're staying awake in vain. All of our measures, all of our syndromic surveillance, all the stuff that we're doing, it's all fine and good. But unless the Lord's in the make, we're wasting our time. And uh, anyway, that is the lecture on, prepare lecture on preparedness. And uh, we got done. Uh, are there any questions about preparedness or anything that we've talked about today. It's only tangentially involved with health evangelism, but um, I think it's kind of interesting stuff and it's nice for us to know about it, know what's going on. All right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. But I think I think what you need to do is if there is uh I, I don't think there's any difference between electromagnetic and non-electromagnetic, but there are electrical therapies that are effective and have been proven effective uh in f the most violent is electroshock therapy to the brain for people that have chronic uh, unremitting depression and uh and it uh it works well uh people end up people end up not being nearly as depressed and it doesn't cause permanent brain damage at all and so that's a use of electrotherapy. Then, of course, uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound is electrically generated sound waves that give you echoes. And then these are uh, uh, checked out. Uh, MRI machines are magnetic. Uh, and the magnets are really, really strong. Uh, uh, there are some tragic stories told of a person in a MRI tube and somebody carelessly walks by with a metal oxygen tank and it flies through the air and uh, ends up 
uh, disintegrating the person who's uh, in the magnetic tube. And uh, uh, even paper clips become lethal weapons anywhere near an MRI. The, the magnet is really, uh, the magnetic waves are just horribly strong. And if you have any metal body parts, uh, you know, artificial hips, artificial shoulder, uh, you, you can't go into an MRI machine. Uh, and so that is electromagnetic, but it gives you intensely detailed views of muscle and fat and bone and tendon. And you can differentiate between all of these tissues and get an exquisite picture of everything uh, in the middle. And so using them for diagnostic purposes is one thing. Using them for uh, therapeutic purposes, uh, purposes is another. But I wouldn't get a device uh, from online that is an electromagnetic generating machine that's supposed to help you with this or that. Because unless you have a human st a study done on human populations that show what diseases are benefit, how much are they benefited, how quickly does the benefit occur, how long does the benefit last, are there any side effects, is this safe? Unless you can find that kind of a study, then I would not use that kind of a device or recommend it. And unfortunately, in virtually every Seventh-day Adventist church I've been to, there's been somebody there with a device or a pill. Let me give you a good example. There is a, there is a doctor uh, at uh, the church that I attended in Crowley uh, who uh, he, uh, had in his home a uh, ozone-generating device. And uh, uh, ozone devices, uh, ozone is harmful. It's harmful to the environment. It's harmful to humans. Ozone kills germs, uh, but ozone in the atmosphere of a house is not healthful to you. And ozone that you breathe in will damage your lungs. Ozone can make you sick. And so at one point I challenged him. I said, why are you selling ozone machines? Oh, it purifies the airs in the house. And I said, well, you know, ozone is bad for you. And he said, well, no, this is approved by the FDA because it doesn't generate uh, ozone high enough to be uh, harmful. Now I said, well, that's very interesting because if it doesn't generate enough ozone to be harmful to people, do you have evidence that it is harmful enough to the germs? Does it kill germs in the air? Does it kill germs in people? Do you have a study that shows me that this ozone generator will get you over your cold faster, that'll get you over the pneumonia faster, that it'll prevent other family members from getting pneumonia, that it'll prevent other people from getting the cold, that it'll uh, keep your uh, house atmosphere more healthful? He says, well, that's what they claim. And I said, well, unless you can prove that it benefits people, I wouldn't sell or use that kind of a device. And um, so there are, there are well-intentioned people who want to do something about health. And let me just make this point about that. I think it's better for you to change your behavior than it is to buy a device. You need to eat less, not get some kind of a therapeutic device. You need to exercise more. You need to get outside. The things that people need are free. The things that people need, don't, you don't have to plug in. The things that people need, you don't have to apply and do things to. They have to change the way they eat. They have to change the way they walk. They have to change the way they live. And it doesn't take a doctor to tell them how to do that. Ordinary people can do that. But I think they should be under the supervision of somebody who knows something to keep them from doing something stupid. Because there are so many people in churches doing stupid things. And that's why we're having these kinds of classes so that you'll be educated. And although what you'll do out there is super simple, it's simple stuff with God's help that makes a difference in society. And don't ever look to a pill, a lotion, a potion, a gimmick, or something that you plug in. That stuff is not needed for people to change their behavior. Okay. Hello, come up close. I can, I, I'm fine, thank you.
Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, you, you may have missed this particular thought, but the thought that I had uh, was um, that what is their BMI? Because uh, if the BMI is 17, uh, if it's 17.9, if it's greater than that, if it's 18 to 25, you are healthy. And, and the truth is, skinny people only look skinny because everybody else is fat. And, and, and skinny people are actually the healthiest people. Skinny people live the longest. If you, find, if you lined up 2,500-year-old people, they'd all be skinny. Skinny people live the longest. People that are overweight die sooner. And uh, if a person is concerned about putting on weight, one question I would have that would solve the issue completely would be, have you been this weight consistently and for how long? And, and if the answer is, oh, I've been this same weight for five years, you're in good health. If a person says, I've, I'm underweight and I've been losing weight steadily, we need to look for a parasite. We need to look for some disease process. We need to check what's going on. And so people can be underweight because they're sick. We need to look for cancer. So the, the answer is not, how can I eat to put on weight? The question is, are you a healthy, skinny person? And if your weight has been the same for the last five years, you're a healthy, skinny person. And don't worry about it. The problem is other people's problem, not your problem. You have the health that's going to get you through to be 100. I have a trouble with appetite. I like to eat too much. And I think I got depressed closing my practice in Texas and moving here to North Carolina. I love seeing my grandchildren, but they're not intellectually challenging. Half the time, I, I, I get on my knees and play with cars and trains. They're four and eight years old, and we ride bicycles, and we go to the beach and surf and stuff like that. And so I put on some weight. I got up to 218 pounds. Now, I'm five foot, I'm, you know, five foot five, uh, but 218 is too much. So I, I, I've been eating less with God's help. So the other day I go to the scale and I'm down to 194.2. So I've lost, you know, more than 20 pounds, close to 25 pounds. I'd like to lose maybe 10 more. And then, you know, so I got the problem. Uh, you don't have the problem. If you've been the same weight for five years, God bless you. You're going to live to be 100. I don't want to give you any advice on how to gain weight. You don't need that advice. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, if if you find it easy to lose weight, you should write a book about that because there are uh, ten million, there are a hundred million people that would like to know that secret. That's a wonderful secret to have. It's so easy to lose weight. Oh come on, you make me sick. <laughs> so let let me assure you of this. The uh, the more you get used to the American diet, the more weight you'll put on. And uh, as time goes on, as people's metabolism changes, they get older. You know, once you hit 35, you're going to wish you were your age again. Yeah, it changes. Never fight low weight. Low weight's good. Keep it up. All right. Well, it's almost time. There's no more questions. Okay. We've had a good time. Hey, this was our last lecture, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I hope you learn a lot uh, in the rest of the time that you're there. God bless you, everyone. Let me say a closing benediction. 
Heavenly Father, we are thankful for these health evangelists who are uh, learning what to do and what not to do. Bless them in their personal lives. Help them to live the health message, and then may they be articulate in sharing it. May they be able to spot error wherever it pops up. May they be uh, have your grace so that they can uh, confront those who are, who are wrong uh, with the love in their voice. Uh, may they lead many people to have victories over bad habits. And may these people all be in heaven as well, because we've shared the good news of salvation with them. And uh, help us uh, throughout the remainder of our lives that our dedication may grow more ardent, our skill may grow more uh, skillful, and uh, our efficiency in winning souls for the kingdom may abound. Uh, so bless us to this end, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go on. Yeah. Bye-bye. Going to leave. <laughs>